Hello, everybody, and welcome to Charts with Dan. I am your host, Dan Merle, here to take you through what we have for the box office, but also talk about some interesting rumors that have been going around about the future of theatrical ownership regarding the biggest theater chain here in the United States. We're also going to talk about Scoob, which is a huge major theatrical release that is skipping theaters altogether to hit VOD this weekend, as well as so much more. But first, let's look at the numbers that were reported for the box office this weekend. As I mentioned uh, the last couple weeks, these are the reported numbers. There are some studios that are have movies that are playing in theaters, but they're not reporting box office numbers. So these are the numbers that have been reported as news. Uh, and the number one film for the second week in a row is The Wretched. As a matter of fact, it clicks up just a little bit from last week in 19 theaters, mostly drive-ins. At number two is How to Build a Girl, a comedy starring Beanie Feldstein. Uh, that movie premiered at the Toronto Film Festival last year, also released on VOD. A Disappearance at Clifton Hill and True History of the Kelly Gang are holdovers from last week. And then... Coming in at number five, and this is the first actual top five that we've had since I've been doing this version of the show, The Burnt Orange Heresy with $45 takes the top five spot. This movie was actually released earlier this year, but it's notable because from the research that I was able to find, this gross does not come from a drive-in theater. This comes from an actual brick-and-mortar theater. That theater is the Lake Creek 7 in Austin, Texas, which is where I found a listing for The Burnt Orange Heresy. This movie, as I mentioned, opened several weeks ago. This $45 gross is from that one theater, and that's because Texas movie theaters have been given the go ahead by the governor of Texas to reopen at uh, 25% capacity. So the, the theater capacity in, in total can't be more than 25%. If you are a family, you can sit together, or if you attend the movie together, you can sit together, but otherwise you have to leave two seats between patrons and every other row has to be completely empty. So the go-ahead has been given in Texas to reopen theaters at a very, very limited capacity. Most movie theaters, particularly the chain theaters that don't have anything to show, have chosen not to open. However, there are a few that did make that decision. One of them is the Lake Creek 7 in Austin, Texas, and that's where this $45 gross comes from for the Burnt Orange Heresy. So this is a little trickling sign as the United States starts to slowly move towards reopening. This is one of the first signs of the brick-and-mortar theater opening, although, again, with the chains... Most, if not all of them, have indicated that they will not be opening before July, before the first major release on the schedule, which is Tenet. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Uh, but uh, the Burnt Orange Heresy, $45 gross from one theater. An interesting story that broke over the last few days uh, and something that sent AMC's stock uh, up today were rumors that Amazon had showed interest in acquiring the theater chain uh potentially as an avenue for them to distribute the films that they make, as well as uh, acquiring the number one theater chain in the United States. Now, these were very, very hazy and unconfirmed reports. Uh, the, the companies themselves did not confirm the reports. It was unclear whether those talks were ongoing. There were indications that perhaps Amazon was interested in acquiring AMC, but is not any longer. It's very nebulous. Uh, and, and I know that a lot of people may say like, well, that's what it sounded like with Disney and Fox for a long time. But we are in a very, very unstable time. So I'm not ready to run with the story yet that this is going to happen. There are certainly a lot of big uh, hurdles to jump over before this becomes a reality. But I think it's an interesting peek at what could be ahead for some of these theater chains who are going to be in dire financial straits even once their doors open again. And another thing that, that could open the door for some of these companies, particularly ones like Amazon or Disney, although Disney has their own financial issues to work out, is the fact that the Justice Department has uh, asked for a reversal of the Paramount decrees, which were the, the laws that have stood for decades now that essentially uh, outlawed the vertical integration of studios owning theaters to self-distribute their own films because they blocked out the competition because these theaters were forced to design ex exclusivity agreements. The Justice Department has asked that those decrees be looked at and overturned, meaning those laws would go away. So when you look at the situation that we're in now, the fact that these theater chains, a lot of them are going to be in major financial trouble or are already in financial trouble, and the fact that you could have loosening regulations, even if this Amazon AMC thing isn't a deal, you could see something similar where a, a, a studio or, or an entity that makes movies 
could be allowed to buy a theater chain, what that would mean for exclusivity, for the availability of movies that aren't in that deal, that is something that it could be a very big story going ahead. So Amazon and AMC making a lot of noise. Not a whole lot of actual hard facts to report at this point, but certainly an interesting rumor. Another uh, big news story last Friday is that China has given the official green light for theater owners to open their theaters in that country uh, with Uh, guidelines and restrictions and safety precautions. Now, theater owners have not yet done that. They have not yet opened their theaters, nor is there an announcement as of taping this right now that theaters will be open on any particular date. But the government has given the go-ahead to do it. You'll recall uh, in late January, there was a very, very brief moment when theaters attempted to open again. Very few of them did so, and then they were immediately closed. This seems like a much more concerted uh, effort. It seems like there could actually be a date on the horizon when China will open those theaters, but we do not have that date, nor do we know what the release schedule will be like if there are going to be any Hollywood films, if there are going to be the, the big Chinese films that were not able to be released during the New Year window uh, and, and elsewhere in the release schedule. But uh, another glimmer of hope, much like the theaters in Texas, some of them, very few of them, uh, if, if, if not more than one, uh, opening, these are the small signs that uh, we are entering in a, in a weird way, phase one of this post-COVID world where things are slowly trying to open. Now, this idea of returning to normalcy is a long way away, and this all has to be done safely, uh, but we are. it seems like we are starting to turn the corner and see, if not here, certainly around the world, other countries begin to open things up, which will follow here in the United States in the weeks and months and uh, and who knows how much longer to come. So that story coming out of China. Uh, but here in the United States still, the, the first new release scheduled is Tenet on July 17th. And again, that is a tentative Tenet date. But you, I, I, you know me, I love a good countdown. And this seemed like a good idea to start the countdown to new movies. Right now, July 17th is the first date that we look to be having a new movie release on the schedule. So that means we are 67 days away from Tenet, 67 days potentially away from new movies. Now, could that date change? It may very well change. That's why the countdown has a question mark in it. But we do have a hard number of days before there is a movie on the release schedule. So this countdown will continue until we hit that release date in July. Christopher Nolan reportedly very uh, adamant and, and 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 wanting his film to be that first film for people to go back and see in the theaters. A lot of legwork to be done between now and then. But as it stands right now, we are 67 days away from new films hitting theaters. We'll see if that holds. But since there are no new movies to watch right now, I decided to do a little flashback to the second weekend in May of 1998. That That is the week when Deep Impact got the jump on Armageddon in the celestial body on a collision course with Earth race of summer 98. Uh, There in second place, you have City of Angels and He Got Game, Nicolas Cage and Denzel Washington and their late 90s uh, height uh, coming in at two and three. Uh, Liam Neeson's non-musical Les Miserables was there at number fifth. And then in fourth place, Titanic was in its 21st week of release. Week 21, Titanic, still in the top five. This was also Titanic's last week in the top five during its initial theatrical run, but even movies like Avengers Endgame, you look at the the market now, unheard of for a film, 21 weeks into release to still be in the top five. That movie opened in December 97 and lasted into almost Memorial Day of the next year. Uh, that uh, That is remarkable. So what are people watching since there are no new movies coming out in theaters? Well, as we did last week, I wanted to take a look around and see some of the top tens on other places to see what it is if they can't go to the theaters that people are enjoying. Uh, Over on iTunes, the top ten movies, right now Ford v. Ferrari at the top of the list, uh, followed by Bloodshot, Bad Boys for Life, and Sonic. Those are two studio, uh, three studio films from 2020. Uh, two 2020 indies, though, at number five and number six, The Assistant and Arkansas, my home state. I'm sure it's very complimentary. Uh, that could just be a, an indication of a thirst for new movies from people that are looking uh, to watch movies, and, and it's, it's not really broken down how much of this is rental and how much of this is purchased, but for people looking for new films on iTunes... 
At number seven, another 2020 film, The Call of the Wild, followed by The Gentleman, I Still Believe, and Trolls World Tour, the movie that launched uh, a thousand angry CEO memos uh, there at number 10. Uh, and you would think that probably next week, and certainly Warner Brothers is hoping next week, that Scoob is going to be in the mix. We'll find out on Friday when that movie hits VOD. Now, looking over at Netflix, uh, Terry Crews has a movie. Now, this is right now, today. This could have changed. Uh, this, I, this could be like if people wa- saw the thumbnail on the homepage at this point. I don't know how Netflix calculates these things. But right now, Terry Crews' is John Henry is at the number one spot. Uh, it co-stars Ludacris as a bad guy whose name is just Hell. Just Hell. So... Sounds pretty bad to me. That's number one. At number two is a Jamie Foxx movie, kind of an overlooked Jamie Foxx movie for 2017, Sleepless at number two. The Michelle Obama documentary, Becoming, is at number three. Then we have Extraction and Den of Thieves, two action films that are holdovers from last week when we looked at the chart at number four and five. Uh, At 2012, a movie from 2012, House at the End of the Street is at number six. I love these random movies that pop up. Followed by The Willoughbys, Dangerous Lies, Despicable Me, which was on the list last week, and uh, Arctic Dogs, which was a 2019 animated film that was really just in and out of theaters super quick. Well, it's on the chart there for Netflix at number 10. So I mentioned that Scoob is a major studio release. It will be hitting VOD. It'll be skipping theaters entirely, as a matter of fact. Because remember, Trolls World Tour technically had a theatrical release and hit VOD at the same time, which is what got it into so much trouble with AMC. Not an issue with Warner Brothers because Scoob is not playing in theaters at all, going straight to VOD here in the U.S. It opens on Friday. And so I wanted to look at what Scoob would need to do in order to be financially viable. We talked about this last week on this show, the fact that Universal thinks that they have found a viable alternative to the theatrical market for some movies, not all of their movies, but for some of their movies. And they made that determination with Trolls World Tour. But I wanted to see what Warner Brothers might be doing in in their heads and on their accountant sheets as far as the math behind Scoob. So a lot of this is guesswork and supposition on my part because a lot of this information is just not readily available at this time but we're trying to figure out first of all what is the budget behind scoob uh, from warner and you look at warner animation group you have a fairly limited uh, set of data but they are fairly close to each other as you can see their biggest budget was lego movie 2 at 99 million dollars but that was a huge celebrity filled voiced cast uh, a, a bigger scale than it sounds like they're going forward with scoob so let's just assume that the budget for scoob is closer to all of the other films that they've released and I'm going to peg it around 70 million dollars now for these purposes I'm also going to assume that the studio put uh, the same 70 million dollars into promotion and advertising that's a metric that we talk about all the time is it's not just the budget you have to calculate usually at least as much for promotion and advertising so I'm doing that for Scoob but but this could also be a smaller number because there were a lot of expenses for Scoob that Warner Brothers did not have this go around. They did not have a flashy premiere. They did not have a big junket uh, that costs a lot of money. Uh, Likely a a lot fewer billboard sales later in the run, although they were buying heavily into billboards and advertisements here in Los Angeles and I'm sure most other big cities prior to the shelter at home order. So I'm sure there was already a big spend for a lot of the advertising that was already done. But for now, let's just assume they put as much into promotion and advertising as they did to the film itself. That would be a total cost of 140 million dollars now it's been widely reported that studios get to keep 80 percent of the vod money as opposed to the 50 to 60 percent of the theatrical gross that they get so in order to make that that 140 million dollars scoob would need to generate vod sales of 175 million dollars now that works out to about 8.75 million rentals uh, 7 million purchases or some combination of the two. If it was all rentals, it'd be 8.75 million. If it was all purchases, it'd be 7 million. Let's be honest, it's going to be a combination of both. Is that a valid number for Scooby-Doo? Well, the 2002 film, Scooby-Doo, written by James Gunn, uh, sold around 26.3 million tickets, total tickets. Uh, its less successful sequel sold just over 9 million. But what you have to keep in mind is that a VOD rental probably accounts for more than one ticket that would have been sold. Uh, when you take the kids to the theater, when you're a parent, you're buying four or five tickets because it's you plus the kids. With a VOD rental or purchase, that's just one. That's one VOD rental or purchase and three or four, however many people are in your family watching the film. Uh, And also no repeat business. So 
uh, yes, 26.3 million tickets sold for Scooby-Doo. First of all, that was a bit, you know, that was a long time ago. That was the first Scooby-Doo live action film. Would the interest for Scooby-Doo or for Scoob have been as high? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but that's what they're looking at. So theoretically, the market does exist or has existed for a Scooby-Doo movie in the past. So why did WD, WB choose to do this? Well, it could be a combination of a different things. It could be that much like Universal, they feel very confident in the VOD market, particularly for a family film. And so they wanted to roll the dice and try to make their money back there. Uh, keeping in mind that they could also reserve the right to release this internationally at some point in the future if they so desire. This is a domestic release here on VOD. Uh, it also could be that they looked at the month of May, which has proven to be a very spotty month for animation. Going back uh, to 2010, there's only a few movies like Shrek Forever After, Kung Fu Panda 2, uh, uh, the, the first Angry Birds movie that you could say even broke out to be mild, moderate, or big hits. So May is not a big month for animation to begin with. A lot of schools are still in session uh, as, as opposed to a lot of the other summer months. So they may have said like, well, we don't think it would have done that well in May anyway, so let's go ahead and put it out. And then it could also be possible that they looked at the the schedule coming up, at what they have on the schedule, at what every other studio has on the schedule, and says, this looks too crowded, we think this movie's going to get lost in the shuffle, so we are going to do VOD for this film. This is going to be another very interesting case study to see what this video on demand market is going to look like and which which film studios choose to put on that video on demand market because Scoob was a, a major release. This was not a small release and it's not like Universal where they had a date coming up and they made a very quick decision to do this. Scoob was initially taken off the schedule and then added back on as a VOD a, a few weeks later as Warner Brothers uh, looked at their strategy. So this was not a snap decision for the studio. So so I'm going to be very interested to see what the numbers on Scoob look like, uh, how those rentals are shaken out. It's a, it's a lot tougher to get those numbers, though, because it's not like box office numbers, which are reported in real time. It's a lot of estimates. It's a lot of what the studio chooses to release because you're pulling stuff from all over, not just iTunes, but Amazon and Fandango and Voodoo, all of the different uh, things that, that the studio has access to that, that no one else does. So we're not going to get hard numbers on Scoob, but I am going to be very interested to see what those numbers do say and how that shakes out for the movie. And I will be bringing those numbers to you in the future, but next week, actually, I think is going to be really, really fun because, you know, I'm setting up the office and, and we're, we're getting things going and we're unpacking a lot of stuff to make room. And I found a hard drive with a copy of this show from 1999 on it. As a matter of fact, uh, the timing was actually perfect. It's almost like it was planned this way. It's it, it's a show covering the release of a very significant prequel in a very big sci-fi franchise. So next week, I will be pulling that episode out of the archive to bring to you. Uh, it is a lot of fun, and I'm super excited to watch it along with you. And then the week after, uh, I'll be right back here in 2020 as we talk about whatever developments have come up with the theatrical market, what we know about Scoob, and then looking ahead to the countdown to new movies. We'll see if that continues, as well as so much more. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to go into even deeper dives on movies, uh, you can join me over on Patreon, patreon.com slash Dan Merle. We're having a lot of fun over there, uh, making even more stuff. I just did a feature commentary for Jurassic Park. Dan's monthly movie club is well underway. We'll be doing that discussion very soon. So feel free to join me there. Uh, but also thank you for watching here. Please like, share, subscribe, do all the things the algorithm loves and uh, I love that you love watching me talk about numbers because I love talking about numbers so thank you for watching and I'll see you next time